Welcome everybody again to our TRC 57 speaker series. I want to acknowledge today that uh, as always, we are hosting this particular series on the unceded traditional territory of the Snanemoch people here on the west coast of what's now Canada. My name is Ted Cadwallader. I'm the director of instruction for the Nanaimo Ladysmith Public Schools. And uh, again, welcome to you all who are joining us today. I also want to uh, introduce you to my two co-hosts, uh, Stephanie Johnson and Lawrence Mitchell. Uh, they'll be uh, uh, opening and closing today in our uh, session and chipping in questions wherever there's uh, questions pop up. I want to also extend my thanks to uh, UBC Press and Carrie Kilmartin uh, for setting us up with the authors who are joining us on this TRC 57 speaker series. As always, we like to open our house in a traditional way. And so I want to uh, turn to my brother, Lawrence Mitchell, and say, Tom uh, Clark, can you start us off in a good way, Mitchell? Thanks,
Yeah. Right. Uh, so, um, so um, I want to extend out to all of our uh, audience today who are um, uh, recognizing great changes in their life or small changes or just dealing with the day to day. Um, some of the things that we'll share today, including that song and that opening, uh, are to bring some medicine into your life. Um, we're on this journey together as a, as a species and also uh, across this network that we have around Indigenous learning. Also on this path around reconciliation. So a little background of how the TRC 57 Speaker Series came together is we're in our school district, like many of uh, the organizations and, and individuals across this country, uh, trying to learn a different way. We uh, committed as our school district on a path that we've named Sia Yatsas, working together uh, to figure out a, a way to walk well on the territory that we serve um, here on Southern Vancouver Island. Uh, we know that we ha have one way of thinking about education and we know that oftentimes that education hasn't worked as well for our students as we would hope. And so we're uh, with the great gifts of people like some and other knowledge keepers. We've uh, decided to be on this path to understand if there's a better, more Holmoch, more Indigenous way of uh, operating an education system. And so through the TRC 57 speaker series, we've had a number of knowledge keepers like the one today who have been uh, shining lights, I would say, in, in education in general, but in particular in Indigenous education. And so our guest today, Kong uh, uh, Siam, Dr. Joanne Archibald from uh, uh, Professor Emeritus from uh, UBC will be joining us today. Uh, Dr. Archibald and I have known each other for quite some time and uh, she's a, a Stotlow scholar, she's an author, she's a, a mentor uh, to so many of us in Indigenous learning for the uh, for for me for the, the past 25 years, but for, for others for more than that. Uh, she's also a lifelong learner. Um, uh, and through her book, Indigenous Story Work, uh, when you get a chance to read it, or if you've already read it like many of us have, you'll see that uh, she also uh, acknowledges and raises up all of those knowledge keepers who've come before us, who've uh, shared their knowledge with us to walk a different way and to show us a path. So we raise our hands to her today. Um, Dr. Archibald is also uh, the only person that I personally know who's shared the stage with the Dalai Lama. Uh, so I get to be one degree removed from uh, His Holiness. Uh, and so I will uh, not set the stage any bigger than that, uh, Dr. Archibald, but I turn the floor over to you. Great, yes. Uh, thank you, Ted, for that very uh, um, warm uh, inter introduction now. Um, and uh, to thank you to uh, Lawrence, Yahukwa Ashai Osiam, for setting this beautiful um, environment so that we can all be together, even though we are apart and we're separate, but we are all together in our heart, mind, body, and spirit. And so I'm, I'm really pleased to share uh, some of the teachings that I have uh, had, had the privilege to learn over the years. And so I'm going to do that through some stories and also through some slides and pictures. So I'm going to put on the share screen right now and then we'll start. 
Um, let's see. Let's run. Um, there. I'm just going to stop for a minute. I have to, uh, sorry, just move this. So now I think I can do this better. Okay, I think we're set now. Yes. Um, I um, acknowledge where I am situated today in the Vancouver area. I am on the traditional and unceded lands of the Musqueam people of the river grass, the Squamish nation, and Tsleil-Waututh people of the inlet. And I am uh, grateful to the stewards of these lands that we can enjoy this beautiful area of um, the land and where the sea and the mountains and the land all join together. And I also acknowledge the people of Nanaimo, where the um, event is, um, where it is being hosted. And I also want to acknowledge the um, dear elders with whom I learned from for many years. And um, I, of course, write about it in the uh, Indigenous Story Workbook. And um, today I'm just going to highlight a few, a few things, but, you know, these dear elders um, had started working together in the late 1960s, and they were leading a revitalization movement of Halkamelan, the Indigenous language and Stalo culture, you know, which had been denied for generations through colonial policies and laws where um, a lot of this knowledge was forbidden to be shared and passed on. But the resistance of many um, Indigenous people over the years has resulted in the ability for us today to be able to carry on this important revitalization movement. But it was as a teacher that I moved back to the Stalo area to teach in elementary grades I, you know, I had actually grown up in the Stalo area. My reserve is Suwali, which is a pretty little reserve. And Suwali means to go around the bend. So there's a windy little uh, creek that goes through our reserve. But I, I grew up um, swimming in the creek or trying to swim and picking, you know, blackberries and playing out in the bush with my cousins. And I lived that life, but I didn't understand, you know, maybe then what it meant to be Stalo because people didn't talk about being Stalo really. And I didn't hear the language. And, uh, and it was, wasn't until I moved back to Stalo area and started working with the Kokolitsa elders. They were part of what, um, you know, is known as the Kokolitsa Cultural Center. But they had started to meet in, in someone's house for lunch and the person would cook the lunch and they'd sit around and, and talk about um, a remembering Halkamelum words and phrases and stories and recording all of that. And so that was going on and I was fortunate enough to, uh, as a part of a uh, a job I had with the school district to work with these elders on uh, the development of a, an elementary curriculum we call Stalo Sito. And we, I was able to sit in on the elders meetings when they then moved to the cultural center. And I remember hearing the Halkamelum language being spoken and I recall so much laughter and teasing, and then there'd be serious work. And it was, it was such a wonderful feeling. And I was blessed to be able to continue working with these elders for you know, almost 10 years, I think. And it was from them that I really learned more about what it meant to be Stalo, people of the river, to learn about the resources of the river, and to learn about the stories, the stories of the mountains, you know, the different um, um, 
landmarks uh, and stories about some of the communities. And, and these dear elders shared a number of stories that we then used in the development of an elementary school curriculum that was then for social studies, because that was the only subject that we could get a little bit more of indigeneity. At, at the time I was teaching, I think in grade four, there was something and grade 10, there was something, but I went through that public school system. And I must say, I, I never felt proud to be indigenous from what I learned or, you know, about indigenous people in school. And I think that's why as a teacher, I felt that wasn't right. And I felt I had to do something about it. But I was appreciative that these elders and other elders had kept the stories alive in their hearts and their minds, waiting for people like me to come and work with them. And I um, then um, used my graduate studies. Uh, I decided uh, I wanted to get a master's degree and, and learn more about teaching. And at the same time, I learned more about colonization. But I did that on my own through my own reading because um, in my master's and even in my doctoral work, there was nothing uh, about indigenous people in the core curriculum. So if I uh, wanted to learn something about indigenous history and culture, I had to do it myself which is fine because in grad studies, you learn to do that. And I was fortunate to come across various, you know, the few books that existed that were written by indigenous people. And so I, in my, my PhD, I decided I wanted to learn more about the purpose of indigenous stories. And so I set off out on a journey to do that. And in my journey, I came across some of these beautiful elders that you see on this slide. Um, Kotlicha, the late Chief Simon, uh, Dr. Simon Baker from Squamish, uh, Vi Hilbert from the Upper Skagit people of the Puget Salish, um, which is now the, across the border, but long ago we didn't have such a border. Uh, Tsimlano Vince Stogan from Musqueam, and Kawasawut, Dr. Ellen White uh, from Snanaimo. And these, um, in, these um, story work elders spent some time with me. And it was a time where I heard a lot about their life experience stories. And I also heard them tell some traditional stories. And it was during that those times that I learned that I had to listen with my three ears. Hmm. Well, Simon Baker told me that and he said, listen with your three ears. And I've heard other elders say that too, but of course we listen with our ears, but we listen with our hearts and we bring our heart and what we hear. And of course, what we see and what we do together. But I learned to listen and to listen carefully and I was lucky that the elders told me some stories over and over, like repetition is actually beneficial and helpful because it helps embed those stories in our hearts and in our minds and in our bodies. And I just, uh, I'm gonna skip over here to uh, Dr. Vince Stogan from Musqueam. And, you know, he, he taught me a lot about reverence, about the importance of recognizing our spiritual nature, the spirit inside us. And we might think the spiritual, um, you know, can mean, it can mean many different things and it's very subjective and personal, you know, but Vince helped me see that, you know, we can have prayerful thoughts or we can open with a song, which is also a form of prayer. And we can open with good thoughts to set a, a good learning environment for others. And I'm going to share one of his teachings and I ask for a little participation from each one of you who are tuned into this session. 
you know, he told us when we gather together, we can set this um, learning environment where we share, where we care for one another. And we bring together the past, the present and the future. And we do this, he said, by we, we hold our left palm facing upwards. So we extend our left palm, face it upwards. And that symbolizes that we reach back to get the knowledge and the help from those who have walked before us. Then we have the responsibility to put those teachings into our everyday lives. And then we have a responsibility to pass those on to others. And we symbolize that by holding our right hand with our palm facing downward. So we're then giving help. So with our left, we receive. With our right, we give to others. And when we are standing in a circle, we join hands with the person next to us and we give a little squeeze and a little smile and that connects us. So we can kind of imagine we're all together and, and doing this. And, you know, it's, it's a way that we um, can pass on our stories, our, our Indigenous knowledge, that we learn those from others and we can learn them from listening, from doing, and, and then we pass these forms of learning on to others. And Kawasawit, Dr. Ellen White, was such a wonderful storyteller. You know, and she also told her stories through the oral tradition. She mentored others, but she also wrote her stories in different books. And this one, Heals, the Creator, you know, has her stories and she worked with her daughter, Vicki White, and Ellen tells the story in one chapter. And in the following chapter, Vicki and Ellen kind of talk about, you know, um, a little bit about the story, a little context, sometimes what it might mean, but also leaving it open for us to think about what we take away from the story. And we are blessed that we have her legacy of these stories, you know, that, that she took on her responsibility to uh, teach others through her stories, through her mentorship. So with these wonderful elders that gave me a really good um, background for uh, creating then a framework for Indigenous story work which I'll get into uh, in, in a, a few minutes here. But I want to share one story that I heard and I learned from Elder Vi Hilbert. And she helped people, um, or she encouraged people to become storytellers. And she also documented the Lushootseet, her indigenous language, and also um, documented a number of the uh, stories. And this one story is um, one that has been a good guide for me over the years. And it's, it's, I think, a fairly short story. So what I want you to do is kind of relax. Um, don't write anything while I'm telling this short little story and just let your imagination have a little fun uh, for a few minutes. And here we, and in our stories, some of the characters can be tiny, what we might think is insignificant little creatures, but they can become an important teacher to us too. And in this story, it's about a tiny little creature named Lady Louse. So just think, one day, Lady Louse goes into her great big longhouse. And as she looks inside this long house, she begins to feel sad because there's dirt, there's gar garbage everywhere. So people have not been looking after that long house for a long time. But she remembers there was a time when the long house was full and it was clean and there were lots of people who came from the four directions and they spent days together talking about their stories, their kinship, their laws, feasting, having ceremony, dancing and singing. And she thought, 
I think it's time to bring back those gatherings. And then as she looked around the longhouse, she wondered, well, how, how can I do that? What can I do? So she, looked, she thought, I'm going to get my little cedar broom and I'm going to help clean up this longhouse. She, she grabbed her cedar broom and she went to one end of the longhouse with the benches and she started sweeping, sweeping away and thinking about all the work she had to do. And there was so much dust, it started to rise. And little Lady Louse thought, oh, there's so much to do. So she swept faster and faster and she got to the middle of the longhouse. There was so much dust, little Lady Louse got lost. So you might wonder, is that all there is to that story? Sometimes, you know, many years ago, I'd hear a story and I thought, hey, was that the ending? Is that all there is to that story? And sometimes some of our stories are like that. They just stop at a certain point. They may seem to end abruptly. But at that point, that's kind of a signal for those who are listening to become part of the story, to start to think about the story, to maybe empathize with a character. Maybe they'll think about some uh, problem they might have that, that has you know, come about because there's something in the story that kind of sparked that idea. And I think that's a form of inclusive quality education to engage the listener, the learner, to make them think, to make them maybe uh, recognize their emotions, to maybe also plan for their actions, and maybe also to maybe soothe their inner spirits. So, you know, with this, this, this kind of stories then, and the work that I did with the elders for many years, it made me think about the importance of becoming story ready. Remember when I said, even when I heard the story or some stories and they stopped and I didn't think, you know, was that the end? Is that all there is to the story? And sometimes the framework of Indigenous stories may be quite different to, in a sense, Western type stories that we may encounter in schools, especially. And then we might think they're not as good as, they're not as valid, they're, you know, uh, because we're not, we don't know how to, how to work with them, how to learn from them. And that's where I think we need to become story ready. So I spent a lot of time learning from elders and other storytellers about the purposes of stories, the protocols that go with them, and thinking about how to use them in ways that might reflect Indigenous ways of learning and of, 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 uh, of our, our way of life. But the other part for becoming story ready was also understanding colonial impact. You know, I, I talked you know, um, there is something about that little lady love story that one time when I was telling the story and we had a few folks talking about it, somebody said, you know, that dust is kind of like <clears throat> the colonial dust where, you know, indigenous people, you know, may have got lost or, or their ways were forbidden, sort of covered over that they couldn't access it. And you know, um, and that was a, 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 a kind of a, a, an aha moment to think that somebody could share that and got me thinking, yeah, you know, our stories, of course, were told orally, they were told in the Indigenous language, they were told in a context. Over time, you know, they, they became translated into English, put into, you know, school literacy form sometimes and it might have changed that story or we weren't um some of us uh introduced to how to how to be with stories you know i've heard elders say they lived storied lives they heard stories all the time you know that was a way they learned and that was a way they they shared you know some some uh, share had shared values 
And so we have to understand how, how colonization has sort of impacted indigenous ways of knowing and being. And sometimes it takes a while to reawaken or reconnect with our um, indigenous ways of knowing and being, you know, part of reconciliation, reconnecting. And along with that, to appreciate today, we can use the term indigenous knowledge systems. And, um, I, I, here we need to think about how stories fit into our knowledge systems. And um, as I think about the core of a story, and I learned this from Kawasawit Ellen White, when we were talking one time, she said, you know, with stories, we have to, we have to make sure we know the core of the story, you know, and she used the kind of uh, thinking about a tree or a plant and we might get stuck on how beautiful the tree is or the flower but we don't understand what makes that tree or that flower grow you know what makes their stem or their trunk strong and so with our stories you know she was saying we have to know the core of the story and often that could be the core values of the story it might be how the story is used in a particular context. Um, and so we have to become story ready and take time. And we can often do that by working along or learning from, you know, indigenous storytellers or elders who take that responsibility to share this with others. And with that, we have to value those learning relationships that we have, you know, with those who are willing to share, or maybe we're willing to learn together. And that's important because in doing this revitalization, you know, we're bound to make mistakes. But if we're working together, we say with a good heart and a good mind, and we have a, a good relationship where we're working together, we can make mistakes. It's one of, I heard another dear elder say, yes, we can make mistakes, but we can apologize. And then we can say, I'm going to do better next time, right? Which leads us into this framework of Indigenous story work using these principles of uh, respect, reverence, responsibility, and reciprocity. And I think these kind of, uh, these uh, core principles, you know, help us become story ready. And when we start using stories, we can use them in a holistic way that they can address our heart, mind, body, and spirit. That sometimes, you know, a story may connect with us on an emotional level. And with that, we can then start to think about, you know, our emotions and, and thinking about what's causing us to feel a certain way. Then we could think about, well, what are we going to do about that if it's an emotion that's difficult for us? and might help us think of problem solving. So that could be part of the physical, actually, you know, doing something. And that when we start to think of these stories, you know, um, they do, they're not just separate silos of things that, you know, there's an interrelationship there. Um, you know, that little lady knows, I think there are many times I felt like her, there's so much work to do, especially at UBC, where I spent many years. And, you know, so much to do that sometimes I got, I got lost, or maybe I got, I lost the vision, because you get sidetracked to, you know, many other things there. And having this, you know, thinking about heart, mind, body and spirit, then is, is good to think about the interrelationships of our story understandings that they may connect us emotionally to actions, to physical, to thinking more or trying to be creative at times. Or maybe we need to uh, find ways that we can address that learning spirit that we have. And when we start working together and sharing, we can create a wonderful synergy that we can have other thoughts and and work together, like maybe little Lady Lo, she forgot that she had a big extended family that might have helped her. And together, you know, they could have uh, maybe uh, not, not had so much dust. Or the other thing is, 
we know dust will settle. And we have another opportunity to be, to see, to do in the world. And when I think about, you know, some of the different um, pedagogies that we might use in relation to story work, you know, we, we know a lot today that people talk about land-based education, being out on the, on the land, being by the river, you know, is important. And we can learn about, you know, this, the, the kind of the, the spiritual nature that nature has, that sometimes sitting by the river, for me, has been so important to soothe my emotions, to calm me at times, to get me centered so I can go out and do some more. You know, and learning by experiencing, sometimes, you know, we can connect to the story, to, you know, a cultural practice sometimes. And through the experience, we learn more about cultural ways of doing something. Um, and, or even with stories, we can role play. I do that a lot with my little, we grandchildren, we play raven and eagle and mouse woman and make up um, uh, uh, adventures that they get into uh, too. And that, that notion of intra and intergenerational is important. I've talked a lot about learning from the elders, but you know, when kids, uh, students of all ages start doing project work, inquiry work, uh, sharing stories, telling stories, they can learn from each other, which is so important. And I think I've talked enough about holistic addressing heart, mind, body, and spirit, or connecting one with family and community is also part of a holistic approach. And that taking time to establish relationships is so important that then we're not alone, but we, we are together doing this work. And other lessons that have come about you know, I talked about understanding sort of the colonial uh, impact. And the do the hard work first, I think is part of that. And I learned this from my, my little grandson, who then was six years old, and we often would do crafts together. Um, and, and this is before COVID, but, you know, we'd be doing the crafts. And when one time, I think I was having a little difficulty trying to figure out how to do something to show him. And he calls me Cecila, grandmother. He said, Cecila, he said, you have to do the hard work first. He said, and then it might get easier, but you have to do the hard work first. So I said, oh, yeah, okay, that sounds like a good plan. So let's tackle this hard, <clears throat> hard work. This, this task, and we did, we figured it out eventually. And then I thought later, yeah, that's like understanding colonial impact. All of us are impacted, not just indigenous people. And we have to think about how that colonial impact, you know, has influenced education over the years for all of us. And with that, we become story ready, which I've talked about. And then we can sustain relationships. And through that, we can care for one another, like that circle, you know, that Simulano, you know, has, has helped us um, uh, uh, start our work and end our work in a way, and that we can share our different uh, experiences. And I'm going to end this um, now just to show you, there's a lot that I've said today, but I have a, a, a website here, indigenousstorywork.com, um, which then I'll just show you here. Um, I think I have to go here. Just, oh, I, I'll stop share for a minute. Um, go here. Okay, now I'll go back to, sorry about that, but here it is. And I know we're getting to a closure here so that we can have a little discussion. But I think you can see this website. Um, Stephanie, is it on the website? Yes, thanks. But I have different videos that talk about uh, the principles of story work and, and pedagogy. And there are some resources here that you can take a look at. And um, 
for those who are really keen about specific types of pedagogy, many years ago, I worked with quite a few people and, and we uh, published this curriculum called First Nations Journeys of Justice. And uh, sorry, that uh, my thing here. Um, and there are stories in this curriculum, even though it's quite a few years old, the stories are timeless. And we have different uh, examples of pedagogy. And this is a uh, curriculum focused on justice aspects, but I think a lot of the uh, pedagogy, could you could adapt that to different subject areas. So within this website, there are um, other types of resources that you, uh, some stories, storybooks, etc. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to end mm -hmm. by sharing uh, this particular um, website with you. So um, all my relations. Mm -hmm. It's good to see them, uh, Dr. Archibald. That's uh, beautiful. Uh, and in fact, uh, Stephanie just reminded me that uh, Kualasawit's story is uh, part of that creator in the Flea Lady. And uh, we've used that as, uh, as an inspiration or, or a metaphor or a, or a teaching tool here in our work in the school district as well. So uh, thanks for sharing all that. And it's wonderful to know that that work still sits uh, in a safe place on the, on the indigenousstorywork.com website. <clears throat> One of the things that stands out for me, and I guess, it, well, stands out, I will say, is a, was a small, small gift that I really rang true for me, uh, not only in the work that we're doing now in the school district, but probably rings true for many of us uh, across this country who are trying to do this work of reconciliation, was when the uh, coyote ends up with two sizes of eyes and is trying to reconcile how to see the world with two different eyes. Can you uh, talk a little bit about that story and how it fits within the work that you've done on Indigenous story work? Sure, right, well, thanks for that. Well, that, you know, the coyote has, and there's, there's different versions of these stories that are found in many different of the Indigenous cultures, but, you know, a coyote had one little eye of mouse and, and maybe that might, might be a way to where we can see what's close to us or think about what we're doing and the other, other, uh, other eye um, was, um, what was it, mouse and what's oh, so long ago since I... I'm not sure if it was rabbit or whether it was his own. Rabbit, um, no, it was the... Uh, the mouse, and it will come to me. Sorry, it's been a while since I thought about that particular story, but the, the big eye, uh, so you got little eye and a big eye, the big eye helped him see that was something far away, mm -hmm. you know, and, and sometimes we can, we can, you know, when I first came across that story, I thought, well, you know, the indigenous stories, that little, could be the little I got overshadowed by the big I by, you know, Western literacy. And then I thought, well, you know, I also heard uh, then it was um, the late Chief Leonard George of Slavo to say, you know, we have to learn the environment in which we, we find ourselves in. And when he was talking about somebody asked him, what can we learn in, you know, the environment of the city? But he said, it's important that we learn so to survive in whatever environment we find ourselves. And that helped me think about, well, I, then if I thought the little eye was really indigenous stories being overshadowed, I had to find out more about the indigenous, the value, the educational um, impact that indigenous stories could have. And also understanding, of course, Western literate ways and finding ways to make space you know, within the educational system. And, that, and part of it could mm -hmm. be that we learn to make the eyes work together. You know, why do they have to be separate? They could end up being together. And with that, then we, and I think that's what we're trying to do in education is we have different forms of knowledge is really, and we're trying to find a good space for indigenous ways of knowing and being so that they're not overshadowed, that they can shine and have their own beauty and power, you know, with, within whatever 
knowledge is happening. So it's not a good or a bad, which I think I started out saying one's good, one's bad. Well, I had to learn, you know, what's, what caused that influence? Why did I think that way? And then to try and change that thinking to say in education, we want to have a really good space for indigeneity. And that's what we need to do and focus on that. I think there's a number of us um, that have been gifted with uh, a different way of seeing the world along the way and then are trying to reconcile that in the organizations in which we work. And sometimes we find those eyes banging into each other and it causes some dissonance in us. But so I like the way you describe that of uh, trying to live in the environment in which yeah. we find ourselves yeah. effectively. Yeah. Ah, that was the buffalo eye. I just thought oh, of it. Yes, perfect. <laughs> An another thing that uh, you, you spoke about in there, and other authors have talked about this too, uh, notably Thomas King, uh, when he said, that, you know, the power of story is really that's all we are, is stories. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that, uh, that Ellen White uh, shares in your book is about preparing students for that story because stories in and of themselves can have great power and the storyteller takes that seriously they're not just sharing stories for the sake of amusement sometimes they are but some of those stories have great power within them and you have to be thoughtful about when and where you share those stories and she sings a song to this these middle school students in there to prepare them for that story um, can you talk a little bit about just the, that power of stories and being thoughtful about how they were shared? Maybe some of the knowledge that those gifted storytellers that you talked about at the beginning shared with you. Yeah. You know, um, this uh, then I think is the important responsibility that storytellers have. And I think um, uh, also note that of course educators have the same form of responsibility for how they then you know work with these stories and i think that um you know storytellers you know have thought about and they're experienced about which stories to tell to tell when to tell them how to get the learners ready for the stories you know, so I think that story readiness, part of it is on the part of us, whether, you know, we're the educator or the storyteller, getting ourselves ready so that we know something about the story. We know a, a context in which it's used, or we know when not to use a particular story, or which ways are probably, you know, um, better better left for a one-on-one -on -one type of learning compared to kind of group learning perhaps. And, and really that's, that's, that's thinking about the readiness of the listener, the learner, you know, and, and I know that storytellers will get a sense of the people with whom they're working, the learners to know how much to go forward with that story. So same with mm -hmm. teachers or educators you have to know your students you have to know you know what they're able to listen to you know how much and sometimes the stories can be broken down into parts but you continue telling the parts sometimes somebody can listen for hours right so you, you kind of know you know uh, something about the listener and then you can also prepare them that's why i think the holistic approach is important too because you know, in, in setting a story, you want to know something about the culture and connect the story to the aspect of culture that's important. So stories are not just isolated things all by themselves, usually, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to do that kind of readiness to know about the cultural context that, that will be um, good for the story. One of our beloved knowledge keepers here, um, uh, taught us that as a district that uh, if we're going to be ready for this journey, then we have to we have to do our own preparation first. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like what you said there. We're not only preparing our students for that story, but we're also preparing ourselves as a storyteller uh, to uh, to make sure that everything works smoothly and as well as it should. One of the questions from our audience members that I like up here it says, "Do you feel the open-ended perspectives 
found in storytelling is difficult for the Western attitude towards right and wrong, mm. etc. Yeah, well, I guess it might be difficult if you think that 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 there is right and wrong, um, mm. you know. But somehow, I think in education, you know, we want to ensure that that um, those who are learning have have you know there are times when you we have kind of open-ended you know kind of learning and responses um and i think we have to set aside right and wrong mm. but kind of open up to possibilities because that's where i think we learn look at you know um how you you know sometimes our greatest insights you know come from imaginative, creative problem solving or discussion, you know, and if we had right and wrong, we wouldn't do that. Now I'm saying there's sometimes you do have right and wrong, you know, when learning some things, but with many of our indigenous stories, they're not like that. That's a different kind of pedagogy. So then you have to use the pedagogy that works for those stories. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and uh, I'll just point uh, our audience members too back to indigenousstorywork.com uh, for some of those pedagogies and, and some of those stories that uh, you can learn a, bit, a little bit more about these sorts of things. I want to uh, raise my hands to you, Dr. Archibald, for joining us today and helping us on this journey. I'm going to uh, turn it over to our, uh, our co-host, uh, Tom Clot and Lawrence Mitchell, uh, to close our house out today with any final remarks. Oh, may I just say thank you for um, to um, uh, Nanaimo Ladysmith School District for taking this important leadership role and being able to share the you know the different speakers videos with anyone who's interested and also to thank UBC Press for partnering shows the the importance of partnerships. So thanks. Thanks to these wonderful hosts. Ms. Tlik with us, see it from PM. Kaichka, like it to eight snowaya. E quam quam stuch tan squala when za ta ali in a swala qua. Really want to thank you, come come PM, for laying down all of the good teachings and all of the good words to ourselves as our reminders and all of everybody that has joined us today and everybody that will view this recording in the future. Um, a lot of good reminders when, you know, listening, listening with my third ear, that's the first time I've ever heard that, but it makes so much sense. And I thank you for helping me in my life. And, uh, really want to thank everybody for joining us today. You know, we wish you nothing but blessings and light and strength as you carry out your good work and we will sh share a bit of a song hkcm shwalakwa
Thank you for joining us, everybody. Uh, and uh, it's good to see Jalen in the background there, too. So I'm glad to invite you for that. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Archibald. Thank you for all of our guests, and thank you for your comments in the, in the chat box as well. I'm glad to see that that good medicine has reached out across uh, all of us today. Uh, join us next time. Stay with. Oh, second, please, on.